Well, first of all, I want to thank Todd, Jen, and the rest of the organizers of TEDx you know, for putting together such a wonderful event. So thank you very much. There have been a lot of really great speakers today, and I just feel really honored just being here. Um, as a movie producer, people always expect me to talk about the art of movie making as well as the beauty that surrounds it. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. What I would like to talk about, though, is I'd like to talk about the lessons that I've learned while making films around the world that have enabled me to help families and communities and neighborhoods to help end the spread of the deadly and devastating disease in Africa called malaria. But before I go ahead and do so, I would like to give you a little bit of background in terms of how it is I got here. I, I remember when I was a kid, when I was about 15 years old, my grandfather came up to me and asked me, you know, what it is I wanted to do for a living when I got older. And I, at the age of 15, I, I really had no clue. You know, uh, I, at that particular point in time, I would just think about, you know, just looking cool, chasing girls, and all the silly stuff that 15-year-olds do around that time. And, so my grandfather saw me struggle through this process of finding an answer, and that's when he stopped me and said, let me give you a piece of advice. Find what it is you love doing the most and you have a great deal of passion for and find a way to get somebody to pay you to do it. You know, it, 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 it may seem funny now, but back then I took it really seriously because I remember going to bed that night and trying to figure out what is it I love doing the most, what do I really love doing the most, and that's when it dawned to me what I loved doing the most was watching movies. Because at that age, I would watch everything and anything. You know, so I spent the rest of the night trying to figure out at age 15, how do I get somebody to pay me to watch movies? <laughs> so I remember waking up the next morning, running downstairs, interrupting my father during breakfast, and asking him, you know, Dad, are there any films you, that you'd like to see in the near future? And my father, being the film buff that he is, he listed out a few films, and I, as he was listening to him out, I stopped him for a second. I said, that's great. I said, how about I save you a little bit of time here? How about I go watch these movies, and I come back, and you pay me to explain them to you? <laughs> well, let's just say that didn't go over well too well with my dad. <laughs> so um, I went to film school instead, and now I create my own films. You know, being a filmmaker has taken me to my second calling in life, and that is to bring to awareness as well as help families in Africa fight this devastating disease called malaria. A few years ago, I made a film in Kenya called The First Grader, which is a feature film that some of you guys might have seen. And this film's about an 84-year-old man that went to school for the first time in his life after the Kenyan government declared education free for all Kenyan citizens. You know, this is a film that inspired me to inspire anybody who dared to dream. But at the end of the day, while making this film, it was the little kids of Kenya who were the ones that inspired me. Because I remember the first time I went to Kenya, I was swarmed by about 100 little children. And in our film, we use local kids. And these kids are some of the most loving and beautiful kids you've ever seen. But at the same time, they come from really poor and meagerly beginnings and dilapidated neighborhoods. And sometimes you look around here, kids like that sometimes grow up to be you know, angry rappers or something. But um, not these kids. These are some of the most well-mannered and well-behaved kids I've ever seen in my life. And during my downtime in Kenya, I would go to the orphanages to hand over gifts and toys, stuff that I would bring from America, things that they don't have there. And I remember going to these orphanages, and every single orphanage I'll go to, they had the same thing, bed nets. But some of these beds had nets and some of them didn't. But these nets were there to prevent kids from being bitten by mosquitoes. But what I didn't know then, which is what I do know now, is that these nets were also there to save lives to prevent the transmission of malaria, which is the number one killer disease in all of Africa. Malaria is so prevalent and devastating in Africa 
that in some countries they have hospitals that are dedicated just to malaria alone. I remember the first time going to Malaria Hospital in Kenya. I had seen so many sick kids just laying there by themselves, and I'd never seen so many sick kids before in my life. And it, watching these kids, it literally pulls at your heartstrings. And I remember saying to myself, there's got to be something I could do to make them feel better. So I decided to go back about a couple of weeks later um, to give them some gifts, you know, that I'd, I'd bought from the local stores. And I remember going back and noticing that there were different faces. And that's when I asked one of the nurses, you know, what happened to that little boy that was laying down in that bed over there the last time I was here? And that's when she told me, well, he's no longer here. I was like, okay, well, here's some toys. If you can give it to the parents and have the parents, you know, give it to him so he can play with it at home. Before I can even finish my statement, she says, no, no, Richard, you don't understand. He's no longer here. He's no longer with us. He's gone. And that's when I got it. Another victim to malaria. And that's when it hit me. So I remember going back to my hotel that day and going online to try to find out what is it about malaria and how it affects children. And that's when I realized it starts off, first of all, as, you know, with flu-like symptoms, and then it dehydrates the child, gives them cold sweats, and then they have anywhere between five to 10 days to live. But what made it even worse in my search is that the following statistics made me cringe. One in every five children under the age of five in Africa will die because of malaria. One in every five. Every 45 seconds in Africa, a child will die because of malaria. Every 45 seconds. If, if I could just ask you all in the audience, if I may, if you could just turn and look to the person on your right, please. And now turn and look to the person on your left. And now imagine this. In 45 seconds, that person is gone just like that. That's how devastating this disease is in Africa. That's what families in Africa go through every single day. 200 million children in Africa are affected by malaria every single year. But the sad thing about it is that these lives can be saved by a single $10 bed net. $10. $10 is all it takes to save a life in Africa from malaria. That is less than the cost of a movie ticket here in the US. But for them that are affected by malaria, that is the choice between putting food on the table and starving. So I had to get involved in some way. I had to help. So I met with the Minister of, of Health in Kenya, as well as the head of the malaria division, and several others, and the answers rang out the same way. The urgent need for bed nets. So I gathered as many people as I could while we were there, and we raised money and we bought bed nets, and we ended up distributing them to some to the orphanages and some to the local hospitals that take care of malaria. But the more I tried is the more I realized that this task is much greater than me and just a few others. So I remember thinking to myself, in order for you to eradicate or even scratch the surface of malaria in Africa, it needs to be done on a much larger scale. Because to be able to create any form of a difference of 200 million kids is no small task. So I remember coming back to the US and forming an organization called End Malaria Now, which is what we use to travel around the US and raise money for bed nets, and had rallies in the US and other communities around the world to help end the spread of malaria. We even came up with our own slogan called Donate a Net, Save a Life, because it's just that simple. You know, and even with Making movies, you always have to find the right team to be able to take a film from creation to the big screen. Fighting malaria is no different. We had to get, take care of not just the net, because that's just a portion of what you do, 
but we also had to take care of logistics, education, as well as follow-up. And in some cases, you deal with the local communities, and in other instances, you deal with some of their superstitions. And people always ask me all the time, what do you mean by superstitions? I remember there was an incident once when we were out there delivering nets, and there was a group of local gentlemen that refused to accept my nets. And I thought maybe there was something I did to offend or insult somebody, and I asked my translator to just find out from them why they're not accepting my nets. And that's when he came back and told me that, well, they won't accept your nets because they're white. I'm like, well, what's wrong with white bed nets? They, they solved the problem. And he says, well, no, what they believe is that if you put a white bed net over their bed, it will prevent them from impregnating their wives. So what I did, I gave them blue bed nets and we solved the problem. You know, so you deal with things like that, but the education is very, very important. You have to educate them in terms of the importance of the net, why the nets are there, and the fact that it could save their child's life. You teach them how to use the nets up at, in the morning, down during the day, and not to take a break because mosquitoes aren't taking a break. And the day you decide not to do is the day that your child could get malaria. Yeah, but the thing is, 80% of children who are infected by malaria usually get malaria while they're asleep. So the other 20% get it while they're running around outside in the evenings. So because we cannot put nets around a child 24 hours a day, we have to educate parents on looking for symptoms, fevers, long-lasting colds, anything. Just take your child to the doctor immediately and not assume it's just the case of the flu. Give them the vaccines and necessary vitamins. But the other thing that's also important, like I said, is the follow-up. Because every three to six months, we'll go back into these villages and make sure that these nets are not only used properly, but the nets are still there. Because there are times when you go into a neighborhood or you, and you get into a house, you, you go directly to the bedroom and you look and you see like, okay, the net that we put up there a couple of months ago is no longer there. But then if you look a little bit to the right, by the kitchen area, there's pieces of your net being used to wash dishes. Look a little bit to the left by the bathroom, it's being used to have a shower. And in some rare cases, if you look outside towards the floor, you see little metal things and chains around your neck because now it's being used for fishing. So the education and the follow-up is extremely important. You know, but the good thing about it, though, is that people are getting it in Africa. And the reason why I say that is because now when we go back, we have lines in the hundreds and sometimes even the thousands, which shows that through education, people are realizing that this will save their lives. And I remember once, there was an incident once when um, we were out there distributing nets, and I was sitting down in the morning, and a gentleman came back and sat next to me, and we're both looking at the line, and he said to me with a big smile, and this is a, a, a local villager there, and he said, Richard, I'm sure in America, you don't have lines as long as this for anything, do you? And I looked back at him, and I said also with a smile, well, actually we do, but they're usually for the iPad, <laughs> you know? But look, I mean, the, the, the great thing of, uh, about what it is we're trying to do here is that our goal to eradicate malaria in Africa by the year 2020 is being shared by millions around the world. Because some of the things that we are doing is that we are working with scientists, you know, to help eradicate malaria with pesticides from the lava stage. Just like how we did in the U.S., because many people don't know that we had malaria in the U.S. back in the 1900s. So by eradicating malaria from the, from the lava stage and preventing these mosquitoes to even be born, you know, allows us to have a malaria-free continent in Africa and not have to worry about any of these nets. Our goal, our goal at End Malaria Now, personally this year, is to raise 200,000 nets for Kenya and Sierra Leone, you know. And, but our goal is also being shared by others. There are other great companies and organizations around the world that are doing similar tasks in other parts of Africa, such as the Bill Gates Foundation. They have an entire division that's dedicated directly to malaria. You have Malaria No More, which is another great organization. You have Nothing But Net and several different others. So what it's going to take to eradicate malaria in Africa is working together, determination, as well as conviction 
that every single person on this planet deserves the fundamental right to have a healthy and normal life. Because really, what it's going to take is a sense of community to fully change this world, just to make it better. You know, because for me, the most gratifying thing that I've ever done in my life is dealing with these bed nets and distributing nets. Because when you have families, parents, mothers particularly, come up to you with tears in their eyes, knowing that they've seen death in their communities, knowing that they've seen death in their own personal families, and they thank you for these bed nets because they know it's either saved their children's life or it's going to save their children's life. For me, that's the most gratifying and humbling thing I've ever been, been through and experienced. That is why change and making this world better is so important. And that's where every single one of you come in. Because my wish for all of you is to find what it is you love that truly inspires you. So you can use those same skills to make a difference in any community around the world. So please, just pick a fight and get involved because you can make a difference. My fight is malaria. Thank you.